We're very excited to have on this edition of the Raz Report, Jeremy Allaire, founder and CEO of Circle. And he hasn't just founded and started Circle, many companies prior, which we will get into. This should be an awesome conversation where you're going to hear about building companies, building enterprises, and Circle, USDC, which is uh, taking the world by storm in a good way. Um, so I just want to get in, get right started with Jeremy here. Uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. Psyched to be here. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for coming on. C Circle is your latest company. I think you've raised over seven hundred million, over seven hundred million dollars for it. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that uh, that's that's exactly right. Um, uh, you know, founded the company nine years ago and have grown it uh, uh, since then. Quite is, a bit. is it has it taken a lot of different gyrations, or from when your original two thousand thirteen founding this company is it kind of where you thought it would be? Like, what 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 does that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting. So, you know, when 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 we founded the company back in twenty thirteen, there were a whole set of ideas that we had about digital currency. And we were very excited about this idea that um, you, you could build what we like to think of back then as an HTTP of money, meaning like a protocol for money on the internet. And um, and by money, we, we meant sort of traditional money, meaning like the liabilities of a central bank, what we think of as everyday money, um, but uh, kind of convey onto that money the power of cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin, obviously, um, itself kind of brought into the world this idea of a protocol that could work on a decentralized infrastructure uh, to enable uh, people to directly exchange value in a digital cash-like way. We wanted to build on that same fundamental technology foundation, but enable people to exchange you know, stable value assets like dollars or euros. Um, and we believe that a kind of protocol layer for money would eventually become possible on top of these blockchain infrastructures. Um, you know, and, and, and that was sort of a core mission and goal from the outset. We experimented with realizing that idea through um, building out a lot of, of kind of digital currency banking infrastructure. We built a consumer facing application that kind of brought that to life. Uh, we actually built it on top of Bitcoin, which was sort of the first generation blockchain that was available back in 2013 and 2014 and 2015 and, and, and during that time period. And then eventually, um, in 2016, when Ethereum, which is sort of the second generation blockchain technology um, really emerged, it kind of introduced more of the building blocks that we had been looking for back in 2013 when we founded the company. And then that allowed us in 2017 to begin work on and then ultimately release what's now known as USDC, which is in fact a protocol for dollars on the internet and, and, and eventually other fiat currencies too. But um, Founding vision was sort of there. The path to it, obviously, you know, it takes you know many, many, you know, sort of shifts and, and stuff. The metaphor I like to use is you can see the mountaintop. You can literally, you know, standing far back, you can see that mountaintop and, and how beautiful that looks. But you actually don't know how you're going to get to the top of the mountain. And you may actually go up one path and realize, oh, I'm staring over a cliff. I need to go back down and go up another path and find my way there. But you can always kind of see see that top. So we're just working towards that. A um, lot of other ideas in, in in the founding vision of the company that we're still early on in terms of pursuing. Very interesting. I mean, um, I so that's that's going to bring us back to some of your other companies. But so Ethereum is what allowed you to go create USDC versus like at first. I know you said you're doing some stuff with Bitcoin, but Ethereum is what allowed you to start looking at the, how to create this USDC. Yeah, so back um, in 2012 and 2013, um, there there were a lot of technologists. Well, not a lot actually back then. There was a lot now, but you know, there were there were technologists getting involved in in the space, and a lot of us got really excited about um, ideas like um, issuing other assets on top of the blockchain or smart contracts and programmable money, and what it would mean if you could have. Um, if you could say issue a dollar token and have a smart contract that could enable the programmability of that, that was like a mind blowing concept. And 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 as as you know, early in my career, I worked on programming languages, app development infrastructure, developer platforms, content infrastructure, lots of things like that. And so I had a background in thinking about you know 
developer platforms and the idea of a developer, an open infrastructure that was like a developer platform for, for money on the internet was super exciting. And um, so there were a lot of ideas on how to do it in 2013. It just technically wasn't possible. And actually the history of Ethereum is really relevant here because Vitalik, who also was really excited about a lot of these ideas of how you could extend this kind of blockchain infrastructure to do other things. A lot of people thought that might happen, that Bitcoin itself as an open source project would evolve to do those things. But there was kind of an ideological battle between those in the, in the, in the core development community who really wanted to kind of keep Bitcoin simple and focused on being a kind of digital gold store of value. And then there's a, a whole other group of technologists that wanted to advance this into being something that's more like an operating system that you could build a lot of things on top of, including things like protocols for, for, for stable coins, DeFi, you know, NFTs, DAOs, all these things that have emerged, right? Um, so it really was, it was, it was, it was really that kind of forking off and development of a new infrastructure layer that then made it possible to pursue um, and execute something like USDC. Okay. And I want to nerd out on more USDC and the history. This is awesome. Like um, how there was two different schools of thought and we'll, we're going to get back to it, but we're going to take it back to the early days. Jeremy, where did you grow up? So um, I grew up in a small uh, town in Minnesota um, and um, uh, by St. Paul or like where? No, no. Southeastern Minnesota, okay. a town called Winona, Minnesota. Okay. Um, and um and and then went went to college in the St. Paul um, at McAllister College, and right. studied political science, philosophy, and uh, a concentration in economics. And um, you got got introduced to the internet um, in my dorm room. Literally in in 1990, had a, a high speed internet connection. Which in 1990 there was not a lot you could do on the internet, but I was down the rabbit hole, became completely obsessed, made all of my educational work about it and started using it um, in my studies around um, kind of what was happening in the former Soviet Union and what was happening in, 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 in uh, the sort of changing revolutions around the world and got me excited about the idea of an open network, open permissionless networks, decentralization, disintermediation, a lot of these themes that still show up today um, in, in the internet space. Um, got me into it uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, graduated college there and, and started working on my first company. Yeah, we're, we're going to get to that. So you're in Minnesota, another where I'm from Michigan. So another Midwestern right. guy. And now I, you know, Midwestern people tend to be very nice. So that's awesome. Totally. Um, exactly. Now, this is a silly question. Did you ever go growing up in Minnesota? Did you with Mall of America thing when you were growing up? So I was so the, the Mall of America emerged when I was a little bit older, um, okay. I think. When I was in college, maybe it emerged, um, and then you know, yeah, cer certainly uh, experienced I, experienced it. Yeah. What I had a girlfriend went to Michigan that lived in Minnesota, and I still remember like flying out there and yeah. spending a date at the Mall of America, it was a movie theater, and these yeah. roller coasters. That's what that's what I remember, and I couldn't yes. believe how big it was. Yeah, was before uh, you know, before Dubai started doing things like that. Right, know? right. This is like this is like 1998 yeah. is when we when I came to Minnesota for that. Okay. Yeah. So as a kid, did you have like, were you doing like, I mean, 1990, we're going to, I mean, that's pretty sweet with the modems. That, that's very early. Um, but as a kid, did you have like side hustles where you like selling the newspaper, like Mark Cuban was doing the garbage bags? Were you doing yeah. anything like that? Yeah. So I, I, um, I did. So, I mean, look, I had, you know, I, I was a paper, paper boy, um, you know, that was my first job if you want to call it. But um, I actually had, I got really, um, uh, lucky in a sense when I was um, a teenager um, I convinced my parents to take you know kind of like some a small amount of money that had been passed down to me from my grandparents um, and was in like mutual funds which was a big deal in the 80s you had mutual funds um, I convinced them to let me invest it into baseball cards and so in the kind of mid to late 80s I ran uh, something called Alaire Sports Cards. So I, I, I kind of ran a, a, a trading operation and I would deal and I would go and, and basically, you know, do, do baseball cards. So that was, that was my side hustle, helped me pay for uh, my spending money in college. 
um, and things like that. Um, so did you did you have tables at like card yeah, shows? Totally. So you you'd buy cards, flip them, and did you make some decent money doing it? Absolutely, yeah. So I I, I took long positions on 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 uh, on certain certain players. I, I you know Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco. <laughs> those were some of the big ones in the late. What was like what was like one of your best trades? Um, it was, uh, it was, uh, um, what was his name? Br Brett, um, Saberhagen. Okay. Uh, okay. Brett Saberhagen was, you know, 19, he was like 19 and one or whatever, you know, he, he, he had just an incredible record and I like accumulated a huge bunch of those. And then like, you know, that was a, that was a short-term trade, right? I, I, I accumulated a bunch and then flipped them at a huge increase in, in value as, as everyone kind of wanted the Brett Saberhagen rookies. Uh, that I think that was that was one of the best uh, one of the best trades I did. Um, and uh, but you know I would I would do arbitrage as well. I'd go to these shows and uh, and you know find someone who really you know wanted X uh, and and I would just run around and find it, and buy it for Y, and um, and then turn it around. So there's that. And then and then you know um, I, I had kind of I, I still have a fairly sizable collection, but <laughs> that was. Yeah. That was oh, so you, yeah. So and now cards are back in fashion. I yeah, I, have a, I, I, have, I have a good friend, Josh Luber, the founder of StockX, who joined uh Gary V and the guy uh Ruben on uh their new card venture at Fanatic. Yeah. And so totally. it, it's 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 crazy. Um yeah, it's crazy. We I still have those boxes from every year, like from 1980, totally. and I haven't opened them, but Hopefully yeah. they're worth something. But uh, so we we now I'm moving back to now I'm moving up to your 1990. You're in college. You're you're loving the internet. You're I mean there's no really internet, but you you had a modem. Yeah. Given your I didn't even have a modem. I had I had a I had a T1, um, which was basically like a a a, a, a hard, I mean a, you know a hard wire. You know, yeah, it was effectively Ethernet, right? But hardwired into a campus network, and you know, campuses were some of the only places that had access to the internet for research purposes. Um, and a T1 was, you know, even now, you know, whatever, you know, I, I, you know, that was back then 1.5 megabits per second, which was really, really good. Yeah. So yeah, that was, yeah. I'm like shocked by the way that you had 1.5 meg. I mean, I remember having 56 K at my parents' house and that was right. unbelievable. Right. Like, right. That, Cause it started at 12 K. Yes. <laughs> Right, and fourteen I, four modems, yeah. Yeah, fourteen four, and then make the noise, and I would be in those message boards or those yeah. forms. I oh. remember like yesterday. Okay, because um, my parents had more than one phone line. You had to do one line. Okay, but I want to move to this. So then you were doing you had you had your success with the cards day, the card days, mm -hmm. and then you were in college, and you have this, you know, you're exploring this whole open network of sorts. Were your parents supportive of that? No, or, not at all. They were they were like, I don't know what this is. I don't understand this. I graduated college in 1993 and my degrees, there was, you know, the tail end of the first uh, Gulf War recession. Um, and my, my college degrees were not themselves that useful, which is fine. I, I studied, you know, what I was thought would be interesting to help understand the world and whatnot. Um, and so I was like temping and, um, but, I, and, you know, on the side, I was just going deeper and deeper and deeper into the into the internet space, and um, and I remember, um, you know, kind of coming home. I quit my temp job and said, you know, fuck this. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be an internet consultant. <laughs> what I called myself, which was basically like um, helping educate people about how to businesses how to use the internet, um, and. Uh, and actually, you know, working on the very, very first websites, right? This was um, before even like Mosaic uh, was out, it was sort of hacking around, basically help, helping organizations figure out how to build stuff on the web. And I went home and my father was just so distraught and just so afraid, like, you know, that, you know, he, he didn't understand any of it. And, and he was like, you know, this isn't, this isn't a job, you know, so concerned. Um, but, you know, I was following my bliss. And um, you know it was good timing <laughs> uh, in, in in 1993 to be kind of really going down that rabbit hole and learning all the technology and figuring figuring out what it was to you know build stuff back then um, and uh, and and that led to the genesis of of some of the first products that I helped 
build and create. Yeah. So, so I love it. So you were like, you term yourself as an internet consultant. You didn't have a role yet. You didn't know what you were doing, but you just said you were following your bliss and some thing that, you know, you're a little bit referring to is ignorance is bliss. Sometimes you don't know. Right. I mean, and then, and then what happens is you created, I think cold fusion. Yeah. Yeah. CFA, yeah I, I remember that was the extension of websites because yes. 1998, 2000, um, Jeff Lawson, who's a friend, I went to high school, middle school with him. He created Twilio, T-W-I. Yep. Yeah, do you know him? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I was in college with him. I had a textbook site called College Book Zone, but he started Versity, V-E-R-S-I-T-Y, Versity Notes. And what did he use for it? Cold, Cold Fusion. Fusion. Yeah. It was Versity because, you know, the extension, right? Right, totally. Yeah, I mean, so ba- I mean, the basics there were um, uh, in 1990. For um, building an interactive application that you could use through a web browser was was virtually impossible, and but learning HTML was actually pretty straightforward. So there are all these people learning HTML, and then in 1995, more people, and I I really wanted to be able to do interactive apps where you could connect a database, you could have um, interactivity. And, and my, my idea was that anyone should be able to kind of build an, a global online service because back then, like the idea of an online service was you had to have AOL or you had to have, you know, CompuServe or, or whatnot. But I was convinced that an open network that anyone could publish to or any device could connect to it would be a lot, a lot better. Um, and so working with my brother, who's a much more, much more of a computer scientist than, than I am, kind of became the product manager designer for Cold Fusion and him the kind of chief architect. And um, we ended up kind of working through a lot of ideas and and building essentially um, the first um, easy to use web programming language and and what is now known as an app server, an application server, one of the, the very first commercial app server, which basically was a piece of software you could put on a machine, connect a database, do transactions, dynamically generate web pages and you know that that paradigm now you know is everything from SaaS and content management and everything else on on, on yeah. the internet um, yeah. so built that and and you know got super passionate about enabling developers to kind of dream what they wanted to build on the internet everything from content to community to e-commerce to all all kinds of things um, and and build you know developer platform business yeah and I mean, I remember the extension CFM, I think it was. You can find it out there. There's still millions of sites with, uh, with, that are still run by that. It's now owned by Adobe. Uh, that, that, that product line is owned by Adobe, which bought a Macromedia, which is I merged my first company, or we merged a layer into Macromedia as a public company. Yes. And when you started Cold Fusion, you and your brother, uh, what you, what'd you, you called the company like the Layer a layer, a layer Corporation? A Layer Corporation, yep. And then we had a whole family of products. We had the most popular HTML web development tool in the world, HomeSite. And, oh, really? And HomeSite had literally millions of developers use HomeSite. So most websites in the 1990s were okay. built using that. Um, and it was one of the reasons why Macromedia wanted to acquire us because they had Dreamweaver. And Dreamweaver was really popular with professional designers. But like the average Joe or Jane would get HomeSite. It was free and it was like super powerful HTML editor. And so we had we had millions of people using that. So, so was, it, was that like home site and front page back in the day? So no, like no one used front page because it was so yeah. awful because it forced you into like um, like these templates. You couldn't get control. So home site was like gave you access to the HTML and made it really really ah. easy to edit the HTML. And we gave it away for free. It was like a feed. It was a freemium product. We wanted to get it out there, and then we got other people into our more advanced products. So um, you were doing freemium before that was even a word. Hmm. Okay. Did you raise money for Cold Fusion when you were building this thing? Yeah. So a layer corporation raised, I think it was, um, you know, three rounds of venture capital, wow. um, and uh, and then like a mezzanine financing, and then we IPO'd in January of 1999, and we were a public company on Nasdaq for two years, and in January of uh, 2001. We merged with Macromedia, which was uh, about um, three times larger than us, um, and and uh, merged the two public companies. 
and I became the chief technology officer of Macromedia. Did, what was like ver versus the IPO process versus the M&A process? Um, what'd you like better? Well, I like building and operating. I like, I like, um, you know, I like that a lot. Um, it's interesting, you know, th there are times and places where M&A makes sense, both as a buyer and as a seller. Obviously, the vast majority of outcomes in business are some form of merger transaction, um, typically, or, or bankruptcy. Um, uh, so the number of companies that remain independent um, is, is smaller. Um, but, um, you know, I think, um, you know, but both had 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 a lot of advantages um, back in, at that at that period of time. Merging at the time was a really good thing for for our company, and actually gave us a, a much stronger platform. That was you know as you recall when nine eleven happened, and the, the the kind of entirety of the certainty of the market and and really the demand for internet software and stuff kind of collapsed um, alongside the collapse of the mm -hmm. dot com bubble. Okay. And by the way, you, you, you didn't stop there. You didn't take this deal and you, you stopped creating. Um, but one of the questions that someone wrote into me during your time building uh, Cold Fusion and the whole, you know, macro media or Adobe days, were there times where you were nervous about failing or there was tough times during that? Or was it more oh, yeah. straight up? Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> every single thing I've ever worked on, there's been tons of ups and downs. Um, and it's, it's there's sort of like a mythology when when you see businesses or companies that have succeeded. I mean, Circle itself has had so many different iterations and projects, and 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 we've we've had different product lines we've built, we've we've acquired, we've sold, um, lots of things. And and the same thing, you know, with 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 Alaire, we had huge huge early success, and then it was more competitive. Um, we had. Um, you know, new new businesses that we had built and launched um, that had a lot of demand around them, but then you know struggled to scale. Um, so, you know, so many things. And then at Macromedia, you know, we had twenty four different product lines, but you know, some weren't growing, and you had to kind of kill the product line or put it in maintenance mode, uh, offshore the development. I mean, challenging stuff. You know, the dot com bust. You know, led to you know effectively. 50 to 70 percent reduction in force in terms of employees that's really hard 2008 crisis when building you know bright cove um you know we had to restructure the company to be cash flow positive um because it was like looked like the world might end um and uh you know we also as a startup tried three four different you know go to market ideas product ideas and that are all thematically going in one direction um, but you know, some of them stick, some of them don't. And, and so you, you jettison the ones that, that don't and you, and you double down on, on the ones that really are. And I think that's, that's just the agility that you need, um, in, 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 you know, building anything, any kind of institution, not, not just a, a tech company. Yeah, no, a absolutely. So bright cove, did you just see like, Hey, there needs to be a better video platform out there. Like, how did you get to starting that? I know. Yeah. You had initial IPO in you know 2012, yeah. and then you left in um, a little bit later. But uh, yeah. how did you get to that? Yeah, I mean, basically, so in 2002, when I was chief technology officer of Macromedia, we put the ability to render video and pro and, and have video as like a programmable object in something called Flash Player. Um, and Flash Player at the time was the most ubiquitous piece of software in the history of the internet. 98% of computers in the world had it. We could actually upgrade the internet to a completely new virtual machine, essentially like a new client in like less than 12 months. So we put video in and it was right before broadband came out in like for consumers. And it was really clear to me looking at broadband, Wi-Fi um, devices that could be connected to those and then having like a ubiquitous playback mechanism for video, I got really excited, started incubating ideas inside of Macromedia for basically self-publishing, self-video publishing type of applications actually built something internally that the company did not want to bring to market. I was really frustrated. My vision was video is going to become as ubiquitous as text on the web. Everyone's going to become a video publisher. Every business is going to be able to distribute um, television quality video to devices everywhere. And so this was in like 2002, 2003. Um, and so I got frustrated and left, went to a VC as a technologist and resident general catalyst and incubated Brightcove. 
and then um, founded it in 2004, really with this idea that, again, video was going to become as ubiquitous as text on the web, and that you needed a new generation of publishing platforms for it um, that could integrate everything that was needed for either a brand, like a corporation or an organization, or a media company itself to basically do direct distribution of television instead of relying on cable and satellite and, and all the old ways and transform other media companies who weren't in television and video into being into television and video. So it was a video platform company, a SaaS company, as we now call these, um, and uh, founded in 20, uh, 2004. And, uh, and it had a really nice growth run. Um, and uh, I took it public in early 2012 um, and then kind of s s stepped into a chairman role after about a year because uh, I had gone down the crypto rabbit hole. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then in 2013, just became obsessed with what was going on in crypto um, and, and made a decision to uh, uh, basically you know, start Circle. Yeah. And this, I'm going to get through one more question on that. Do you, do you like, are you like mad or no, like cold fusion? You were early on this stuff with cold fusion. Like, do you wish that was a de facto standard for web applications speaking to databases? Um, I just remember cold fusion was my first website. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then, then ASP became around like, .NET came and then there was other yeah, ones. Yeah. Do you ever think yeah. about that? I mean, I think, I mean, first of all, I'm so happy because I got to build something that millions of people got to benefit from and, and tens of thousands of co companies and enabled. I have so many people who come to me and, and I randomly meet who say, like, you changed my life. You changed my career. You made it possible for me to accomplish things I never thought I could do. And that and that's really powerful, empowering people. You know, the, the, the logo for Cold Fusion was a fist and a lightning bolt. And it was sort of like empowerment, Cold Fusion. The idea of Cold Fusion itself was like this free source of energy. Um, so it was really about empowering developers, enabling people to express their ideas. And I did that. And we did that. And it was awesome. And so I feel great about that. But technologies get obsoleted so fast all the time. I mean, no one uses ASP. No one uses any of this stuff now, right? People are using you know, Node.js and right. they're using, um, you know, they're using, you know, whatever, Python, they're using yep. Ruby on Rails, whatever they're using, dev development languages, frameworks, tools, et cetera, are constantly in a state of, uh, of change. And then, you know, new paradigms emerge, mobile apps, iOS, Objective-C, you know, C-sharp, all this stuff, you know, it's just constantly evolving. So I don't feel bad about that at all. I think it was a, a, a contribution of, of to, to the development of an industry. And, and the same thing's going on with blockchains right now. And I know we'll come back to that, but it's like basically all these blockchains are just competing for developer mindshare, their operating system like platforms. And, you know, what we're using today is very likely not what we're going to be using in five years. Like no one kept building on DOS. Eventually there was, you know, Windows 32. And then people abandoned that and, and built on other things. So I think um, there's there's always this evolution, this t technological obsolescence. It's, it sounds like a natural progression. Um, but you definitely can wear the flag that most sweet websites back in the day were cold fusion. I remember when Jeff Lawson switched versity to cold fusion and I'm like, Oh wait, do I need to do that? That's my website too. Now I remember it. That's why I know the dot CFM days. I would yeah, look yeah. to see the extensions. I, it's just so totally. funny to me. And I was in college and so was, okay. So now we're the last 20, 25 minutes of this interview. It's all circle. It's all crypto, but to get to the circle, Mark Cuban, uh, emailed me a question. Okay. Um, Mark Cuban's known you from his tech days. Yep. His, his question is, what did you learn from your Alaire or your database days that you are applying today? Oh, I mean, I, I, it's actually really relevant. I mean, you know, as I talk about the inspiration for Circle and, and kind of what, you know, I've sort of, sort of been inspired by in, in this space, I mean, in, in many ways, right, what got me super excited about the internet in the first place was this kind of obsession with um, the idea of the internet itself being an open network that was permissionless, that anyone could bring a computer to and connect, and that anyone who, who did that could take open protocols like the SMTP protocol or the HTTP protocol or the VOIP protocol or these sort of protocols, which are really just 
public IP, intellectual property that's open source, it's in the public domain, people can write software to it, and that you could connect um, anyone anywhere through these protocols and do really amazing things in terms of information exchange, knowledge exchange, communications, so, so powerful. That's what drew me into the internet in the first place and, and kind of an obsession with open networks, decentralized and distributed models and, you know, and, and what that could un unleash and really a belief that that architecture, um, you know, could maximize um, access and could maximize the ability for people to, to, to reach the most people in the world and entrepreneurship and ideas. So that's what kind of, that was what informed, you know, the work around cold fusion back then. And so if I fast forward to crypto, you know, that was fundamentally the insight for me in 2012 and early 2013 was, this is just like a replay. This is just another open protocol on the public permissionless internet that solved a set of problems that hadn't been solved before, which was a way to ensure that data could not be um, counterfeited uh, and that transactions could happen in a, in, with, with certainty uh, in an irreversible way without requiring centralization. And like, these are big ideas. And it was like a, a, a fundamental new infrastructure layer of the internet was being born. And so when I looked at it and said, okay, this is going to do for the exchange of value. And I don't just mean mo moving value from point A to point B. I, I'm talking about the richness of what we do in exchanging value as people, as entities, as corporations. It's going to do for the exchange of value what the web and those earlier protocols did for information and communications. And to me, in 2013, like that was so profound because I actually believe the web of value exchange, if you want to, whatever you want to call it, the internet of value, is going to be extraordinarily more valuable and extraordinarily more impactful than the web of information. And so it very much informed wow. um, how I think about this and the work that we're doing here. Wow, well, that was a great answer and makes a lot of sense why, how you're here today. Um, when, you started, when you started Circle, did you start with anyone else or was it just by? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I co-founded the company with Sean Neville. Sean is absolutely brilliant. Um, he uh, he, he co-led the company with me, almost like co-CEOs for a long time. And then several years ago, he just stepped into a director role. He's on the board of directors and he's he's he runs a crypto incubator, a crypto kind of um, studio incubator. Okay. Brilliant. But he and I had worked together back in Allaire, my first company. Um, we worked together a bunch at Macromedia. We worked together at Brightcove. Um, he's just one of the most brilliant minds, um, technological minds, strategic yep. minds, creative minds. So, yeah, so he, he co-founded it with me. Was Circle easier to raise money for than your previous ventures since your huge track record of success? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, when, when, when we started the company, I kind of went to people who'd invested with me and who'd made money with me in the past and said, this is what I'm working on. And they're like, Bitcoin, like, I, I don't get this. You're crazy. This seems crazy, but, um, you, you know, we believe in you. So go, go for it. Um, uh, I mean, that kind of, kind of thing. So it definitely, definitely helped. And, um, and then even, you know, 2013 and then 2014, 2015, you know, during that time, there were not a lot of quote unquote adults in the room in the space. If people think it's a wild west now, it was an extraordinary wild west back then. And we kind of had, you know, seasoned entrepreneurs, technologists. Um, we, we had a really strong proactive approach with regulators, um, with kind of major fiduciaries and, and really worked really, really hard to try and build something that was compliant. Um, and that, you know, differentiated us as well and allowed us to raise, you know, quite a bit of capital, you know, I think, you know, a couple hundred million dollars within our first few years of getting started. And were you, were you personally buying Bitcoin back in those early days, 2013, when Bitcoin yeah. was probably nothing? Yeah, absolutely. And buying Ethereum when it was, you know, less than a dollar and Did, buying and Solana you, when it was less than a dollar. <laughs> and you still own some of that? I am a uh, I am a owner of crypto assets. Um, I have uh, I, I don't talk about my uh, particular trading and liquidity strategies, but I, I'm long. I'm quite structurally long uh, on 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 uh, on crypto. Uh, okay. Crypto assets, yeah. All right. And and 
the question I was going to say, so what, so what was the idea be, uh, behind USDC? And then also, what would you define as a stable coin to a fifth grader asking you the question? Yeah. So, you know, on the internet today, I can download a piece of software like WhatsApp or, uh, or, or, or log into a service like Gmail um, or open up Google Chrome. And I can connect to anyone else directly. I can have a, 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 a direct communication with them. It doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't matter where they are in the world. As long as they have a, a, a smartphone, they can get that piece of software, we can do that. Or if there's someone who has an idea and wants to connect their computer to the internet and put some content on it, as long as I have a web browser, I can connect to that. Um, and, and that's generally the case, uh, other than you know some authoritarian regimes that have great firewalls. Um, but you, even there, like it's generally the case, you can connect connect to anyone. I, I can freely communicate with anyone in China right now. Um, and that model is so straightforward. We just it's the air we breathe, right? It's the air we breathe. We don't even think about it. We, the the fact that this kind of open connect and you know open permissionless global decentralized network of communications and information exists. So why can't we do that with money? Why can't we have a way where someone can just download a piece of software from a, an app store and uh, and then someone else could download a different piece of software made by a different creator or a different piece of hardware or log into a service and exchange value with each other instantly, globally, frictionlessly at no cost. Um, it's, it's really that simple is how do we make it possible for storing, moving dollars or digital dollars to work in exactly the same way we have with information and data. And that's what we set out to solve is that problem and doing it on the DNA of the internet, doing it around this idea of, um, a, you know, a, an open protocol that anyone could connect to. So that's, that's really the fundamentals um, uh, of what, of what USDC allows for. And, but I think, you know, the, the idea goes, goes far broader because you now have essentially a, a, an open, an open API for dollars on the internet and it's programmable dollars on the internet. And so you can do a lot with that. And, and, and so um, the use cases are really, really uh, exploding. How big is USDC these days? So USDC um, uh, has grown really fast. Uh, uh, at the start of the pandemic, there were about 400 million USDC in circulation. That was just like, let's call it six months uh, or, or no, it was like a year after or so after we had launched, um, and uh, and then it grew to four billion in circulation by the start of 2021, and it grew from four billion to 42 billion in circulation uh, at the end of of last year, and it's already grown to uh, to over 52 billion in circulation just in the past couple months here, uh, and so USDC is um, about that big, and um, and has supported you know trillions of dollars of transactions just on the public internet using blockchains. Um, and it's still early days. It's super, super early days. Our view is that eventually there could be more than a trillion USDC in circulation and could be used for every imaginable use case for money. Uh, and, and use cases that we haven't even thought of because programmable money has not existed until now. I mean, this is one of my most exciting interviews I've had because I've been dying to ask more questions about this USDC, as you know, I'm an investor in USDC, but I also know several, com many companies, hedge funds that use USDC to exchange and quickly send over the blockchain and love it, swear by it. Yeah. And it's like the greatest thing ever to, since sliced bread. And and this guy that I talked to last week about when I was telling you this interview, he just couldn't go. He was just going, it's, it's changed our life as a business. Yeah. We're able to, you know, quickly send money, get receive money, convert it to USDC, then put it into USD. I mean, yeah. I, I, it was like a total nerd out, but, but, and you know that. So the questions that like, and I've watched a lot of interviews, you know, the question my brother has, so I just, you know, it's like, we're doing these characters. I got the brother, conservative guy, attorney, he's very smart. Um, he, the first question he asked me is, well, how can they, how can USDC or these different exchanges offer such nice interest rates when 
banks are giving 0 0.0 or now they're giving 0.5 but how can they offer you know interest rates from four percent to twelve percent or ten percent yeah that's the first question that you have to answer for my brother yeah so I, I know I, that's I, not you I, I know that's I know that there's different I know there's circle yield so yeah if you're an institutional client or thing you can yeah. go to circle yield which as you said in several interviews it's over collateralized and you should be protected but we'll get right. to that one I just wanted to know like some of these places are 10 percent nine percent Voyager BlockFi Nexo Genesis et cetera. sure yeah I mean look um so if, if you think about it you have a kind of base layer which is the sort of digital cash, digital cash equivalent of USDC. And, and that is this, you know, always redeemable for a dollar. Um, and, and, and it's a regulated, you know, digital cash instrument um, that exists. And it's very easy to exchange, right? To, with, with point to point as your friends or, or, or others that you've talked to, really, really straightforward to send it, receive it, use it. Um, and it's become very, very popular as a digital currency to use in, um, trading, investing, international payments, other things. And so as its utility has grown and as more and more people and firms want to use it as a, as a form of working capital, as a new kind of electronic stored value working capital mechanism, there's higher and higher demand for people who want to borrow it. And so one of the really powerful things about blockchains is not only do they allow these fast transactions to happen, but you can actually build, um, you know, essentially, you know, borrowing and lending models on top of it. And so there's grown over the past, in particular, the past several years, last two to three years, large, both centralized, what are often called CFI lending markets, and what are called DeFi lending markets, where the market of borrowers and lenders is convened by a piece of software on the internet. So you're not dealing with a company, you're just dealing with a protocol. But nonetheless, you have essentially interest rate markets of borrowers and lenders. Um, and the demand to borrow USDC is high. And the interest rate that borrowers are willing to pay is, is high. Um, and that is the source of those yields. Basically, you have borrowers. And, and to put it fairly simply, um, the, the other side of, of that borrowing, um, and, and I'll use circle yield as an example because it's, it's the one I understand probably the most. Um, you lend us USDC and we lend it wholesale to institutional borrowers. So these are in fact hedge funds, family offices, systemic trading firms, electronic markets firms, or you know other major firms in the ecosystem that want to operate using USDC. And these are firms that are borrowing at a high interest rate, but who are generating returns north of that. So, it, you know, a, 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 an 8% interest rate, to, to borrow at an 8% interest rate or borrow at a 10% interest rate, that's not unheard of in a lot of things. Our credit cards are 20% interest rates or 17% interest rates. You know, venture debt, which is what startups borrow, typically have interest rates of, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14% on them. Um, interest rates in securities lending markets, which is the interest rates that um, say uh, 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 an institutional fund would, would pay to borrow against their stock can be fairly high. Now, you know, corporate debt uh, that's underwritten where a corporation's borrowing against their, their, their balance sheet and their P&L that's underwritten by an investment bank and has a coupon and a rating and so on, that tends to be a lower interest rate kind of debt product, right? But generally, when you look at interest rates that people borrow, they, they, they vary from you know, uh, you know, low single digits to high double digits or, or higher. And so what you have in, in USDC is you have a, a borrowing and lending markets that exist at, at the retail and institutional level. And those are those are floating um, right now. So on DeFi right now, you can borrow, uh, you can borrow USDC, uh, I think for like 3%. Um, uh, so, you know, the, 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 inter the interest rate markets adapt to kind of market conditions and demand. Yep. And you could, I mean, you could, and then you could, you could 
you could borrow, but then you can earn interest at a longer term. You can lock in six months, 12 months, um, right? That's right. That's right. How, how can they lock that in if they don't know if the borrower is it the borrow is the borrower borrowing short term or are they borrowing a long term when you lock in for six 12 months yeah. on on circle yield i'm referring to yeah so with with, with circle yield if you if you um if you want to uh, effectively um lend uh for six months or, and and get a, a a fixed rate uh a fixed rate and a fixed return over that time that's exactly right the, that capital is then being utilized downstream by borrowers for longer periods of time. Um, okay. So they have o effectively, oftentimes they'll have like uh, the, the equivalent of like an open credit facility uh, that they're utilizing uh, in their own business. And that credit facility has a term on it and a time frame on it and the like. Got it. Okay. So now I... I personally use Voyager, a little bit of BlockFi, and doing I guess some stuff at Genesis and Circle Yield. I try and get, trying to I'm getting an account open. Yeah. Um, so no, I'm working with your customer service there. Is uh, you know, so we're we're getting there. Yeah. Um, but um, and why am I using the different different places? Part of it is diversification. But I guess my question is, it's the commonality is USDC, which to me reminds me of the cold fusion days, like. You're the creator of this protocol that everyone uses now. You know, there's a natural progression, as you said, different BlockFi technologies and hopefully USDC, which I can't see it not growing. But is there, you're not able to look at the collateral that let's say BlockFi has or Nexo or something has. So what's like the, do you have to review what their collateral is? I know you get audited or USDC gets audited monthly yeah. to make sure people can pay it back. But a question I get all the time is like, how secure is my, you know, money in USDC at one of those other exchanges? Well, you, the the thing to remember is USDC itself is uh, is regulated, examined. It's the USDC itself is a full reserve dollar digital currency. Now, if you're lending your USDC to someone else, you're you're determining what is the credit risk that I'm taking with who I'm lending to. It has nothing to do with USDC. It has to do with what are they doing with, with it. Um, right. So there are some major differences, right? Are you a secured creditor or are you an unsecured creditor? Um, is is that is 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 this unsecured credit that's then being used uh, to do highly speculative trading, or is you know is this secured you know credit with known institutional counterparties, right? So you're dealing with with a huge variance. It's you know. I like to use the example of a bank, right? If you walk into a branch of Chase and you say, here's $10,000 and you're quote unquote depositing, you're not depositing $10,000, you're lending Chase $10,000 and you have a balance that says $10,000. But actually what you have is you have a claim against their loan book. They're taking that $10,000 and they're lending it out eight times over. And they're and and you're basically saying, hey, I I think that they're going to be good for that. That the the small business loans, the credit card loans, the home mortgages, the corporate debt, all the stuff that they're doing to take my money and lend it out on a fractional reserve basis eight times. But fundamentally, you've got an IOU, and now you know you you might look at a dollar that you've quote unquote deposited at Chase really really different than say. Uh, you know, a, a let's say you went to a, a, a bank in Zimbabwe and they said, you can deposit your dollars with us. And you'd say, well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Are you going to, what are you going to do with my dollars? And so it all comes down to, you know, what, what, what in fact are, are you, what in fact are, are you seeing on the other side of that? So we've tried to design something with Circle Yield, which is um, very institutionally friendly it's regulated, it's supervised, it's over collateralized, um, and it and it only you know faces the best quality um, institutional wholesale borrowers on the other side. And so we've just tried to build something with, I think, the kinds of, of features that make it attractive. It doesn't produce the highest yields. It doesn't produce the same yields you might see through some of these retail platforms. But there's a reason for that. Okay, I know we have time for like two more questions, two or three questions, yeah. and I want I want to get to CND, but the because I want our, we have a lot of investors. But before I do that, um, so what you're saying is like 
you know, each place is different, but I guess like, so if my, if your grandma or whatever wanted to put in some money in the USDC, obviously there's circle yield, there's other exchanges, but would you say diversify in that, in terms of that? So if I had a hundred thousand dollars and I wanted to put it in like four, I wanted just USDC. Does mm -hmm. it make sense to sometimes put some money in Voyager, some money in BlockFi? Like what I'm, what I'm really asking is, is there a chance of default? Like I saw the cred. Yeah. Cred went bankrupt, but that was yeah. not because of USDC. Yeah. And that's the question I've been asked from like yeah. people in the it's, basic. Yeah. It's a great question. And so the, the way I think about it is, um, you, you know, a, a lot of these products that are for individuals um, have kind of come out and, um, yeah, provide some information. But um, I think there's limited information. And in fact, this has become a major issue from an investor protection, um, uh, you know, uh, re regime, right? That's so, the insurance, yeah. you know, so very clearly, like, I think the SEC's view is that these are lending products. Um, they're not banks. Um, and in fact, for uh, the average person, they're, they're basically making an investment. And a lot of these are offered um, as uh, as as un unreg they're unregistered you know investment contracts in a sense and so BlockFi you know notoriously uh, settled with the SEC that they in fact their their earned product or whatever it's called um, was in fact um, you know not not registered as a security and, and should be and so they you know settled for a hundred million dollar fine and filed an S one. And so what, are, what is an S1? An S1 is a public disclosure document that a retail investor can read and understand. And you can decide, you can read through the S1 and say like, what are the risks? What is this? Like, what am I actually getting into here? And so that's fair disclosure. So that's people and, 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 and you know, the, the, the review of a major regulator, the SEC, right? Um, and so that's one, you know, one standard to look at. There are others that you know, don't don't have any of that, and so you don't actually know what what the underlying risk is, other than the reps that are made through marketing or maybe some high level stuff. And so, I think you have to you know you have to kind of look at look at this um, you know through through that lens. Now, DeFi is a different story. Um, if you um, you know get uh, get USDC and you connect it to um, you know compound. Or Ave, um, or what about, or what about Grow? Um, I I I don't know Grow very well. Okay, I um, saw it. it's a new thing. I don't know it either. Right? Yeah. Um, so you know, you know, DeFi protocols have 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 some advantages to them, um, but they also have a whole lot of risks to them as well. There have okay. been DeFi protocols that are hacked, um, and this is like software, and all of a sudden the money is managed by software, and the software gets hacked, and they, you know, that, that that that's gone. But you have some, you know, um, DeFi protocols that are are more pressure tested. There's probably going to be more and more disclosure audit type requirements on DeFi protocols over time as well, as the market participants yeah. want to have quote unquote better hygiene around them. So you know, I, I think you know, buyer beware on all this stuff. Yeah. Um, Totally get that. And, and I think we'll have to have you come on again to talk more like CND for, for investors. Because I know you have a thing to run to, but when yeah. you say buyer beware, like um, I, you know, I talk to the CEOs of Voyager who, you know, believe yeah. that well vetted borrowers and, and very trustworthy, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. My only, I guess, contention was if any of these places do have a problem, like USDC has a brand and you know, and like, it would could potentially hurt USDC's brand. So like, do you talk to these exchanges to make sure that they're like doing the, like trying to like making sure the borrowers are good or is it, is it like, or is it the same thing as like, you can't, like, a bank went like the treasure treasury doesn't talk to the a local bank saying, Hey, be careful on what you borrow send out. Yeah, it, it is. It is really different. So we're, we're um, because USDC is kind of a free floating digital currency, um, you know, it can be utilized in so many different applications and so many different businesses and, and so on. Um, and, you know, you've got, you know, electronic markets firms that might be doing a trade with someone with USDC for, for $300 million in one transaction. You've got other, you know, 
NFT markets that are, you know, utilizing USDC for micropayments on pieces of digital content. And, th and those are, you know, kind of multiple um, layers removed. It, 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 it is important, though, that what we need to always ensure is that people understand USDC as a do di dollar digital currency itself is safe, stable, transparent, well-regulated, compliant, all these things. Um, but, you know, just like you use your dollars uh, with, uh, you know, you know a, a, an online, you know, payment service, you can still be defrauded. It wasn't the dollars that defrauded you. It was the Yep. It's the other other side of it, right? So so it is like you said, buy everywhere, but you know, and diversify, what have you. And yeah. I don't know if you have 120 seconds to, or a minute to talk CND. Sure. I know you guys increased the valuation. So I was invested in the SPAC, which changed valuations because yep. you guys increased it. So someone yep. wanted me to ask you about that. If you don't want to address sure. it right now, we can do it in a later interview because I know you have to, another no, obligation I'm, to get to. I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, so... Um, we um, we neg initially negotiated a merger with Concord Acquisition Corp um, and and uh, and a, a business a combination agreement um, in July of last year. Um, and getting through the SEC qualifications taken a bit longer than we had expected. We had thought it would be you know consistent with other SPACs, you know four or five months. Um, it's just taken longer. And which is fine, and we're getting through it. We're getting, you know, making progress through every round of comments. Um, but as we kind of walked into the new year, um, the business outlook has changed pretty significantly. Um, the company, uh, you know, grew USDC really rapidly. Um, we're in a rising interest rate environment. Um, our our transaction and treasury services businesses are are taking hold nicely. And so we looked at, um, you know, the the actual deal was set to expire. Uh, in April, and so we we uh, we renegotiated the deal. We extended the timeline so that it had enough time to get through the uh, DSPAC and the and the SEC process. Uh, we also um, uh, eliminated the pipe uh, from the first deal uh, so that the company had the option to raise capital privately before the DSPAC, and and obviously the the headline valuation went up. But I, what I would note is alongside the 8K up. Uh, also available on our investor relations site as well. And, and with the 8K, we also issued um, revised financial outlook for 2022 and 2023, which are considerably stronger um, from a from a, a, both a top line and a bottom line perspective uh, from where we were, you know, nine months earlier or, or whatever uh, that, that, that exact timeline is. And so the, the increase in, in the value of the company is really reflective of the tremendous position that we, we've put ourselves in with, with, uh, with the business yep. and obviously the, the new outlook. Yep. And, and there's warrants, CNDWS, which I, you know, I think they're like about yep. 125. I, I mean, I like, I love circle. And I think what you explained to the users and listeners, because it is it's USDC, you're not backing up these banks. You're the means of what, just like a US dollar. And it is like, I don't know if you had, let's just say a hundred thousand dollars and you, you can use circle Well, circle. You, I think there's a certain minimum requirement, but there are banks. Some are offering 12%. Some are offering four, some are offering eight, you know, they're all different. And the way I look at it is diversify. I, I do. I wish there was like a, a hedge fund or a fund that had like 10% here at Voyager, 10% yeah. here at this. So yeah. that way I could be even more diversified versus manually having open up accounts um but there, you know, there are there are emerging like stablecoin yield funds and, and stuff like that um so i i see all kinds of stuff happening okay yeah i mean it's because i i personally you know i told you i have a lot in usdc and um but it's also the the firm you work with and reading up about about them and i i think what you've innate you've enabled cryptocurrency to me i know bitcoin gets all the press but to me you've enabled cryptocurrency to go mainstream to have your principal you know, not change all the time and have some interest on your cash with the examples you gave about credit cards. I mean, when I give 10,000 to Chase, I'm not just giving it, they're taking that 10,000 and they're leveraging that up five times. That's and right. so yeah. why not as a bar, as me, why not get interest on that? And, um, and I know there's other investors like Mark Cuban and USDC and I mean, tons of investors, like you said, yeah, the yeah. market and um, any last words, um, to get to and appreciate your time, Jeremy. I know you're a busy guy, 
building the future of the industry and you've done it numerous times over. So we thank you for your time. But any last words you want to say about USDC Circle or anything like that? Yeah, no, I, 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 I appreciate it. I appreciate the time very much. And, um, you know, I, I guess my, my final comment is, you know, while, while you know, it, it, it has grown a lot, um, you know, we, we really think we're in the early days of this. Um, and, and we think that the the kind of volume and usage of, of digital currencies like this is going to be so much bigger. And the thing I'm most excited about is, um, you know, the, the, the use cases that are yet have yet to be um, invented. Um, and, and sort of coming back to my developer uh, tools days, um, you know, programmable dollars on the internet and on open blockchains is going to unleash creativity in, in, in not just financial products and services, but in just how the economy even works. And so we're excited to just see what happens. Yeah. And here at Benzinga, we try to track it, but maybe there's a new product we got to create here with that as well. We have like 30 million readers that come to our site a month and there's probably something there that we're not thinking about. But yeah, I mean, if you look about your cold fusion to what you did with Bright Cove and you have digital dollars on the internet, it is so extendable that what we're sitting here talking about today, yeah. I mean, is going to be a hundred X bigger that, uh, well, anyways, we're going to, we'll stay in touch with you because awesome, you're on the cutting edge. Thank you again for the time to come on the Raz report. Really appreciate it, Jeremy. My pleasure. All right. Thank you.